Started as a U.S. assistant U.S. attorney, moved to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, and then on to Burley Cass in its last year as what it was at one point the first of the national major environmental law firms, and she went there to try for, we're still trying for environmental justice. And finally, she uh, ended her private legal career at Arnold and Porter before she went to Seton Hall. 2000. But during her time at Seton Hall, she's beyond endless writing, conferences, articles, chapters, book reviews, and the like. She has taken on, she, take, she probably took on in, what in New York and probably anywhere that they have such a thing is probably the worst kind of job anybody can ever imagine. Uh, she was the chair of the New York City Rent Guideline. Now, any of you that live in New York City know about rent control. Oh my God. Why would she ever do it? But it just shows you the courage and sort of um, you know, courageous people have to have sort of moody moments or something like that. And she did a hell of a job on that if you're a tenant. Not such a good job on that if you're a landlord. But you know, there's a, this is a zero win situation that she was in. Yeah, I hope the landlords not have rollback. Her okay, I forgot she did that. <laughs> and she saved the city a huge lawsuit by doing that. Um, I've only watched her teach once and talk to her once, and I think she would. She must be. She's a fabulous and read her article. A fabulous thinker, and from what I could see yesterday, a fabulous teacher. Um, she started a discussion. I was at a discussion yesterday with uh, faculty members, and she started a question. They started her talk um, with a question that Justice Roberts had asked to a lawyer in Fisher versus United, uh, University of Texas, which is one of these endless litigations with the University of Texas and affirmative action. And of course, as it's gotten more conservative, it's also gotten more snarky. And so the question is that, so uh, in, the, in the discussion, uh, Justice Roberts asked one of the lawyers, what unique perspective does a minority student bring to a physics class? So that was the starting point of Rachel's uh, talk, which was absolutely mesmerizing. It was remarkable to me that, you know, it's such a rare treat. She takes this question before the court and then actually has an answer, many answers, and I'm sitting there saying, she's making this is great. This is a real answer. Where were these lawyers who are getting all this? attention before the Supreme Court. Anyway, I'm sorry that you missed all that, that talk, but today she's addressing not the same issue, but not a dissimilar issue in her talk calling, confronting implicit bias, racial anxiety, and stereotype threat in the law schools. And what I'm really pleased to see that there's no colon in that title. That's good news. And so uh, I really welcome, I hope everybody joins me.
So implicit bias is a, is a topic that's become more known, and I'm going to talk about that both definitionally, why I think it's an important concept for all of us in a law school environment and beyond. The two other concepts that I'm talking about are somewhat less known, but I think uh, at Perception Institute, which is a consortium with which I'm affiliated of social scientists and law professors and uh, ad advocates of all sorts and culture makers, we think we, it's impossible to talk about implicit bias without talking about the anxiety that tends to arise when issues of race are discussed. Because if we only have a bias lens in mind, we really miss half of the picture. And if part of the goal is to bring a community together, we have to have the full picture. So I'm again excited to be here, excited to see some people who were in class uh, yesterday and uh, back today, and look forward to hearing some discussion after I present the information. Uh, and I will require engagement from the audience, so I hope you all have some energy, because I can't do this by myself, I have to actually work. So um, this work, in some sense, begins with, with the conception that the country, for the most part, and I have to keep qualifying this more and more as the election cycle goes on, for the most part, the vast majority of people in the United States actually do consciously adhere to the values of equality, generally speaking, think that racism is immoral. Uh, one fact that's fascinating, I think I shared with the class yesterday, uh, when, when doing polls about what is most immoral, being a racist comes between being a drunk driver, which is three, being a pedophile, which is the most immoral, being racist is number two. So for most people, the idea of rejecting kind of the, the vision of Dr. King's dream is seen as literally immoral. And yet, we know, as a country, we haven't reached a point where we, I, I will master the clicker, I promise. <laughs> um, as a country, we haven't reached a place where it feels as though we've achieved this ideal that has been espoused for so many decades. And I think probably most people would agree to that. Um, the Perception Institute and my engagement with implicit bias and the mind sciences, because as your dean uh, so graciously sort of shared with you, I have a long history as a lawyer uh, prior to 2008 when I first started working on social psychology issues. And the reason I did is because uh, this person, one of my true idols and colleagues, John Powell, um, when I was working on the Obama campaign in 2008, when we were in another kind of crucial moment for the country as we are now, John's concern was that there was a lot of anxiety that was surrounding then Senator Obama's candidacy that people didn't know how to talk about. There was crazy, like, we don't really know who he is, you know, sort of, does he care about people like me? And the campaign basically, after the Philadelphia speech, just ceased addressing race. They wanted to put it behind them. And surrogates were going out on behalf of then Senator Obama and going to union halls and other places and basically saying to people, you know, you may not want to vote for him because he's black, but he's better for your pocketbook. And the union members, many of whom were white, like, how, how dare you suggest that I wouldn't vote for someone because of his race? You're calling me a racist. And what their natural instinct, as most of our natural instincts would be if someone is suggesting that we're racist, was frankly to come up with 10 reasons having nothing to do with his race why they were opposed to him. So John thought this strategy was both insulting, frankly, to the voters to whom we were being taught, and also, frankly, very counterproductive. And John is a civil rights lawyer like I was, so he brought together all these social psychologists and neuroscientists and mind scientists, and we learned about these concepts that helped us explain how it could be possible that people could truly believe in egalitarian values, and yet our behavior could be far from aligned from those values. And that allows us to have a completely different conversation about the role that race and ethnicity and other lines of difference play than we have without that idea. And so I'd like to share with you how it is that our brains can, in, in a sense, get in the way of allowing us to behave and live according to our values and what that looks like. And in a law school, this is a crucial conversation to have because the role that how we interact plays in ensuring that every single law student has the opportunity to be their most fabulous selves is very much dependent on the kind of environment that we create. That we create as professors, again, you're lucky to have this fantastic dean, I'm sure he does all this fabulously, um, but the environment that we create for students <coughs> is of such importance, and this quote is from someone I work with 
uh, at NYU, Josh Aronson, he uses this when he talks about stereotype threat, one of the concepts I think is really important. The idea that human intelligence, our intelligence isn't fixed, right? We're not always the same degree of smart in all contexts. You know, and you know what I mean, right? Sometimes you'll be with people and they laugh at your jokes, like he's laughing at my jokes, so I like him. Uh, they laugh at your jokes and they allow you to feel comfortable saying interesting, challenging things because you sense that there's an underlying respect for who you are. That's the kind of environment that has to be created in order for students to be their most fabulous selves. And race and ethnicity and gender and sexual expression and other lines of identity difference can get in the way of this in ways that no professor, no teacher intends. And so that's one of the reasons that in the law school environment, it's so important that we understand what we can inadvertently convey, those of us who are in the front of the room, that may be getting in the way of our students achieving to their capacity and believing themselves to be capable of all that we know they're capable of. And I'll just give one bit of scientific information that I think is really fascinating. Because sometimes what happens when you're in an environment like this one, where, again, I'm confident that everyone on this faculty and every administrator and every person who's involved with the operations of this law school wants every law student to succeed, and certainly their race, ethnicity, gender, etc., have nothing to do with the limitations on aspirations. And yet, I'm also confident that if this, if this institution is like any other institution that I've been in ever, there are moments where people who don't fit the dominant type, either by, again, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, feel as though their difference matters. And it's probably the case that there's not really dramatic, horrible things that happen, although there may be. I haven't done my homework, so I haven't found out if something awful has happened here. But I would presume that I would have heard. I think Akilah would have told me. <laughs> she wouldn't have let me come in So my guess is the kinds of incidents that occur, that occur at every institution that I've been involved with, are kind of ambiguous. And they're the kind of incidents that cause conflict because if you're part of the dominant group, you're kind of like, well, you know, maybe when the person said, you, you know, you're lucky to be here um, when a student of color brought forward a concern, maybe that didn't have anything to do with race. Maybe that was just a comment. Or maybe not. It's ambiguous, right? And so what we see from this slide, this is a slide that's part of many slides, is that the experience of ambiguous discrimination has very different effects depending upon where you're situated. For those of us who are white, when blatant discrimination occurs, we're very surprised. It is inconsistent with our experience of what this country is supposed to be about, and so it causes an enormous amount of cognitive interference. We're very disturbed. Ambiguous discrimination, we're not quite sure what to do with that, and so we just kind of don't think about it so much, we might not even notice it. By contrast, for many, People of color, this particular study was looking at black and white, but for many people of color, blatant discrimination results in a clear emotional cognitive response. Anger. That doesn't feel good necessarily, but it's very clear. By contrast, these experiences of ambiguous discrimination cause a lot of emotional turmoil and cognitive interference because the person who has either seen it or has experienced it themselves is grappling with, is this about race or isn't it? And as you can see from my chart, ambiguous discrimination causes more cognitive interference for students of color than blatant because it, it, you ruminate about it. And so that's why it, these little, supposedly little issues, they really matter. And we, those of us who don't experience them, at, you know, we're not, we're not the subject of them, have to take them seriously if we care about the environment that we're creating because they matter. So, who am I talking about when I talk about we? In a sense, the professors are at the front of the room, and we matter. Who we call on, how we look at students, who we notice in the halls. You know, it, it's hard for us, once we're in front of the room, to remember the ridiculous degree of attention we pay to particularly our first-year law professors. Like, I can tell you every article of clothing 
that my first year law professor was war, and I have to just pretend that I don't remember that, otherwise I couldn't stand up in front of my first year students without like, really becoming self-conscious. But the DU, you know, we give so much power to our professors. They define our lives so much. And so, I, in my view, part of my pitch when I make, when I present this information, part of what I'm trying to do is to invite, inspire, you know, drag along all of my colleagues who are in front of the room to do a lot more work than we're used to doing. To take all these issues seriously so we can do right by our students because we do have a tremendous amount of power. So the next question is, why is it and how can it be true? Am I, am I right when I say that most Americans of all races and ethnicities think racism is wrong? Or is it really that many of us who are white are just lying? I don't know how what you're all thinking in the audience. I can't tell, of course. But I know in, oftentimes when I give these presentations, there's some number of people in the audience who are like, that can't be true. If people really cared about issues of race, they would behave differently. So if they're, if they're conscious, if, if consciously this was important to them, they would behave differently. And that's a very reasonable response to have. So part of what I want to do is explain to you how it can be the case that people can consciously really think something is right and really believe in something and really intend to behave a certain way and actually not behave that way anyway. And the way I'm going to do that is to step away from race for a second and ask all of you to engage in a very famous social psychological test called the Stroop Test. Everyone with me? Because I, I, this requires group engagement or it doesn't work. And it's a very simple task. I'm going to ask you to state the color of the text. All I'm asking. But you have to do it out loud, and you have to do it as quickly as you can. So let's practice one. Ready? Blue. Much more energy. Come on, I'm being all energetic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Red. Green. Green. Black. 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 Green. Red. something that's habitual 
and, some, and, and to frankly have your conscious executive brain prevail over your oh so powerful unconscious. So the current data for this, and I'm sure it'll change, is that our conscious brain processes 40 bits of information in the same amount of time that our unconscious brain processes 11 million. Our unconscious brain is powerful. And so there can be so much that our conscious brain would like us to do that it's really hard for us to do. And so that's, of course, the beginning of my attempt to share with you and hope, you know, perhaps convince you, although that's ultimately, I'm not you know, a dogmatic person trying to make everyone believe what I believe, but it's part of my explanation as to how we can have conscious views that end up being inconsistent with our behavior. And it's basically the way our brains work. And I think the best metaphor for this is, <laughs> the best metaphor for this are babies. So people will say often babies are born blind. Babies actually aren't born blind. They are not functionally unable to see colors and stimuli. They just don't have any categories into which to put those stimuli and colors. But that adapts and that changes without anyone teaching them anything. Sort of our brains create categories for things and for people just by evolutionary adaptation. We have to do that. We have to know as you know, little children who we can trust. Um, we have to know as adults how we navigate the world. My best example for this is if you're on a subway and a person is about to uh, lean over and kind of look for the next train, which people in New York do all the time, um, if an adult does that, you have to just let them do that even if you're like me and you win. If a child did that, it would be absolutely appropriate for me to race over and heroically pick the child up and bring them to safety. But as I said in the class yesterday, if I did it to an adult, that's, you know, battery, basically. <laughs> so we have to divide people into categories just like we do things in order to function. But of course, that's where the risks arise because there are categories into which we divide people that have all sorts of I'm going to play this. Okay, so there are categories into which we divide people by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by sexual orientation, by religion, that have a set of associations with them that are negative, even if consciously we don't agree with those. Those associations exist in our unconscious brains, and those are the associations that we respond to quickly. So I'll just give you one example, and you've already seen it because of my clicker issues. Um, but let's pretend you didn't see any pictures. If you read, and try and do this honestly, if you read a Swiss newspaper reports an American was accused of tax laundering and held for questioning, what race or ethnicity and gender do you think that person likely would be? And even before you saw my pictures, you might have seen a picture. What, what? Oh, cool, you didn't. Okay. So you're absolutely right. It is a white male. What? But there's nothing in those words said anything about white males. Is that an American? We're all Americans, and many of us are not white males. Um, it just said the person was a tax launderer. There are many white males here who are not tax launderers. But something about this particular description in every group I've ever shown this to, everyone always thinks, oh, it's got to be a white guy. And the nature of the particular issue, you know, who knows exactly, but that's the response many of us have. That's our default category for Swiss bank tax launderers. <laughs> right? That's what you call that. And luckily, when we look at a single white male, I don't immediately think Swiss bank tax wander. You know, so it doesn't go the other way, luckily for the males who are in our lives, uh, or white. But at the same time, these default categories exist for us in all sorts of more consequential contexts. And so what implicit bias is, is the automatic association of stereotypes and attitudes to particular groups. That's what implicit bias is. And it is often the case that our implicit associations and stereotypes, or our implicit attitudes, because those are different, right? One is a set of traits, the other is warmth or coldness. Those are automatic and instantaneous and quick. And they often are very inconsistent with what our conscious, slow, thoughtful brain, you know, a la uh, slow, slow and fast thinking, uh, the Dan Kahneman book. So this is what implicit bias is. How do we know we have bias? Well, there's actually an exercise that we can take uh, that stemmed from an original, uh, an original test involving flowers and bugs, where 
a social psychologist wanted to see if he could train himself to associate positive words with really disgusting bugs, but pretty, with the bug, as quickly as he could with the flower. And he found no matter how many times he created this little computer task where he pressed you know, the button on the left if it was a, if it was a, a pretty word and a flower, he could do that really quickly, and a button on the right if it was a, you know, an ugly, disgusting, gross, and a bug, he could do that really quickly. It didn't matter which hand he did it, he could still do one very quickly, one on, on both sides. But as soon as he changed it up, as soon as he tried to have the quick taps with the words that were dissonant, pretty, and cockroach, <laughs> there, was always, there was always a time lapse. And so that time lapse helps us understand where the categories exist that So the time lapse is called the implicit association test. You can go on Project Implicit and you can take the test. And you'll, it can help you see whether or not there are categories of people about whom you have quick associations or quick attitudes that are perhaps different from your conscious attitudes and associations. And it turns out we are very, our behavior, not surprisingly, is often determined by these quick associations and our, it's very powerful. So here's an example of a, an interesting study where uh, groups were given uh, resumes for police chiefs. And the resume was either, as this indicates, streetwise, person who came up from being a beat cop, or you know, Harvard PhD in criminology. And the groups were asked to choose who would make the best police chief for your community. Remarkably, whatever the group Whatever resume the group received, they always chose the one that was male. And they always thought they were doing so because of merit. Well, we need someone who earned the support and the respect of the beat cops. We need someone who's on the cutting edge of criminology. And actually, no one, and these there were women on this group too, this wasn't all about men. No one really thinks that they actually consciously didn't want a female chief. It was rather a lens through which you're reading the resumes, and it's really easy when the criteria are ambiguous to just have them alter so that they support the candidate who fits your default. Let's be honest, if I said police chief, how many of you think of a woman when I just say it? I don't, I'll be honest, right? When I say engineer, I don't think of a woman. My colleague who does this work said when she heard a female voice when she was on a plane, and it wasn't a, a flight attendant, it was the, the, uh, the pilot, she actually had a moment of like anxiety. And then she thought to herself, I bet this is the best pilot in the country. <laughs> there are so few female pilots. Um, but again, it, so this is not about politics. This is not about being a good person or a bad person. This is about what are the default categories we've all absorbed in our lives. Oh, this is, this is, I love this. The favoritism, the male favoritism was the greatest for those who were most convinced of their ability to be objective. <laughs> and we often find that. Those who are absolutely firmly convinced, I'm someone who never would allow race, ethnicity, gender, or any of these categories to affect me, are often the worst. So thinking that you are the most objective ever, move away from that. Because it puts you, it puts you at risk. Um, so this is another very powerful and frankly very disturbing um, study that was done by a, a, a consulting group, but it's been looked at by social psychologists, because I got nervous when it was a consulting group, but it's been looked at by social psychologists and, and everyone has found it to be sound. Law firm partners across the country were given a memo and told, do we want you to look at this memo and see whether you think this person would be you know, sort of appropriate for your firm? It was supposed to be a male associate who had gone to NYU, third year associate, looked at the memo. Half the partners, you know, law firms always have pictures on their little bio sheets. So half the partners were given a picture of a guy who appeared white, half the partners were given a picture of a guy who appeared black. And as you can see from the comment section, it's very distressing, right? But, but those could be cherry picked. I mean, the most distressing probably, we think white Tom Meyer is a generally good writer with good analytic skills. We think black Tom Meyer needs lots of work as average at best, and we can't believe now, when I say those things, it just it's, it's, it's terrifying that the same memo could elicit those reactions. But those could be just a few bad apples, right? Every firm has bad apples. Um, but when we look at the average 
spelling and grammatical errors that were intentionally embedded in the memo. And when we look at the average number that were found, we see that on average, the partners who read the memo they thought was written by a white associate found half as many of the spelling and grammatical errors as those who read the memo by a person they thought was black. So here's what's interesting. Do we think those partners are wildly racist people who don't want to hire African American associates? I don't. I think if it had been a great memo, they would have been <laughs> thrilled. But I think when it was just a good memo, their stereotypical back brain came into gear. And when they saw the first, those who saw the memo by the white guy, they saw the first typo, didn't really think anything of it, just kept reading along through their objective lens. But when they saw the first typo in the memo they thought was written by someone black, it triggered a stereotype and they became hypervigilant. And so this study confirms the fear that many young lawyers of color have. Literally here, I have to be twice as good to be considered equal. Like in this case, it's liberal, and that's obviously somewhat serendipitous, but it is. So this is the work, right? The work isn't, are exceptional people going to be identified? And if the memo was awful, written by the white guy, people would have known it was awful. No one would have said, oh, this is a good memo, it was horrible. But it was just good. And we see what happens and how the lens through which you're reading something can literally lead you to a different conclusion for the same product. It's really distressing, right? Now, we see this in healthcare, and I'm going to start moving along because I think I, my time's going to get really soon. Um, we see this in healthcare, and there's some really distressing studies in the healthcare field. The one ray of hope I'm going to share with you from the healthcare research is that in one study, again, a horribly distressing study showing that residents with high levels of implicit bias were able to appropriately diagnose healthcare conditions across race. Race didn't affect their, their diagnoses. But residents with high levels of implicit bias, and let's be honest, very large percentages of all white people have implicit bias. I'll just be honest with you on that. Those with the higher levels of implicit bias did not recommend the same treatment for black patients. They recommended a more invasive treatment because apparently there's a stereotype that some doctors hold about levels of compliance. But the good news from that horrific study is A, medical schools and institutions and doctors are taking all this very seriously. Uh, but the other good news is that one cohort of those doctors were given a very tiny written instruction. It was not like a hit you over the head, by the way, this is about race, you better make yourself look good kind of instruction. It was tiny. That said, race can be a factor in treatment and recommendation decisions, you know, essentially, if we're not careful. And it was embedded in a whole bunch of other instructions. To a person, those residents self-corrected. Didn't matter what their implicit bias levels were, they were able to give diagnoses across group without there being these stereotypes that affected them. So again, like our color test, being aware of the risk can do a lot of the work when you're doing something cognitive like evaluating treatment recommendation decisions or something cognitive like reading a memo. Just being aware, if you take that seriously, can do a lot of the work for you and that's really important. Sometimes people think this is mainly an issue of essentially anti-black racism, and that's a big part of implicit bias, but it's certainly not the whole story. Um, a colleague of uh, mine, Jerry Cutler, did a really interesting study because there's often this, this notion that Asian Americans are considered the model minority, and there are all these positive stereotypes that they benefit from, but his study was, what about Asian Americans want to be lawyers? <laughs> are they benefiting from positive stereotypes? It turns out, no. Uh, when prospective jurors were asked to listen to a deposition, half thought you had the gentleman on the left taking the deposition, half thought the gentleman on the right taking the deposition. The people who thought they were listening to a white male litigator thought he was assertive, thought he was warm, thought he was representing their interests effectively, and they would absolutely recommend him to a family member looking for a lawyer. Somehow, the people listening to the gentleman on the right didn't think he was assertive, thought he was rather cold, weren't sure he would represent interest well, they had a very different reaction to the same deposition. So again, the associations linked to being Asian American can be positive, but they can also be very constricting. What if you want to be an actor? What if you want to be a litigator and not an engineer? Right? You want those options. You don't want to be put in a box. 
for, so some, some block festers, when I share this information, they say, well, thank goodness we're smart enough that we're not going to be at risk of doing anything <laughs> awful like those law firm partners because we blind grade. And that's true, and that's good. So we know that the grades we give on our exams are not affected by gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera, because we don't know who anybody is. You're all a number to us. However, as we know in the law school context, students spend a semester viewing us and a semester watching how we view them and how we respond to them. And implicit bias is not only cognitive and evaluative, it's also behavioral. How much you look at someone, how closely you stand, how you, you know, hear questions, whether you remember names, a lot of that can be linked and tied to our biases. And so if a student is spending a semester watching some people be responded to with enthusiastic reactions to their brilliant question, and other people <laughs> be like, hmm, interesting. Let's talk to someone else. You know, there's ways that if we have implicit bias, again, we can't trust that we're going to be able to truly judge the merit of people's comments without a biased lens unless we're really working toward that. Because we're in the same toxic racial soup that everybody else is. We're not better than doctors and practicing lawyers. And so this is the kind of thing that can happen in a classroom. Who do we call on? Do we respond to answers differently? Who do we, how do students respond to each other, right? Do the students listen and sort of follow up on someone's answer? Or do they just kind of let it go and act as though it wasn't really anything interesting or worth hearing about? So there's a great deal we have to be aware of in our own environment, both how we handle ourselves, we're professors, if we're students, how we're treating each other, that will create the atmosphere that essentially follows the student into the exam. Okay, these are just a couple of examples and I'm gonna move past them quickly. These are things that are often said. These are all examples students have given me. These are things that are often said that again, no one means, I didn't mean anything. Where are you from? No, where are you really from? That somehow is almost only said to Asian American, Latino, South Asian students. Rarely do white students get that question. Um, you must have had such a difficult childhood. Oh, yeah, I suppose. But you must have overcome so much to get to law school. I guess. You know, the poverty. My dad's a lawyer. My mom's a doctor. Why is it that you're saying this about me? Right? And again, these are all comments that students share with me. The, you know, in some sense, the worst is, your work is really quite good with this weird sound of surprise. So no one meant anything with any of these, but on a regular, constant basis, these can chip away. These are the ambiguous kinds of discrimination uh, that can lead to cognitive interference and not allow all of us to be our best selves. Um, so this is a, a very disturbing study that just doesn't necessarily, that, that comes into play where, wherever we are, we just have to be aware of it. It can be difficult for us to empathize across group. We literally don't see each other's pain the same unless we really work toward this across group. So the pin in the hand, somehow we, on both sides in this instance, this is black people and white people, when you see their own group, the pin in the hand, you respond as though you felt the pin yourself. And I, oddly, we all respond the same way when we see the purple hand, but we don't respond the same across group. And if we can't see each other's full range of emotions, if we can't empathize, that's going to lead to a different level of engagement. So again, it's something we can work on. None of these things are fixed, but they're things we have to be aware of. Um, I'm sure no one has experienced any of these stress overload, time pressure, multitasking, discretion, ambiguous discrimination, ambiguous qualifications, incomplete data, and the lack of critical mass. I'm sure, that's not the case anywhere, anywhere. <coughs> um, and I'm sure we all have good intentions, self perceived objectivity. None of these, the, the, everything on my right, or your left, I guess, uh, increases implicit bias, and everything on my left, I guess your right, doesn't decrease it. Those are not, that doesn't do the work that we need. Instead, we need to really work in a different way. And there's some steps that have been identified to actually reduce implicit biases. And you know, I'll show you the steps and I'll send the article around to everyone. I highly recommend them. And you have to kind of figure out the group you're most vulnerable to having bias towards. It's not necessarily obvious. Taking the IAT can be very helpful for this. And de-biasing or reducing bias is, is great. 
But let's be honest, we all have too many biases to be comfortable that we're going to reduce all of them by tomorrow when we go to class. So we have to, in, in some sense, those of us who are in positions of authority or power over people's lives have to break our practices, have to alter our behavior, because we have more control over that than we do our biases. And that's the work we can do immediately. Some of it has to be systems and practices, uh, but some of it is, is essentially work that we can do once we're mindful that we have to do that work. So these are the steps, and again, during the Q&A, if anyone wants to, if we have time, I'll, I'll happily talk you through what those steps are. And again, I will absolutely share the article uh, with Akila, and she can share it with anyone who's interested, because these steps have been shown to work and to have the, the bias reduction occur over time, and they're very powerful. Um, but we have to also, as I, as I mentioned, get to these other two concepts, so I'm going to keep moving. These are some suggestions, and again, I'll happily share the, the, the slides with everyone, too, so you don't feel like you have to read all this and, and take notes and take it all in immediately, because that's going to be impossible. There are ways that professors can take steps starting you know, immediately to make it far less likely that our implicit biases are bleeding over and affecting the students with whom we interact. And to me, that's the work we should be doing. We should be accountable for that, that's our work. But I do want to mention these other two concepts because as I, as I suggested, it's critical that we not go from, oh, I'm a good person, I'm not racist, you know, those other people have problems too, oh my gosh, I must be biased, and I'm gonna go into hyper-anxious land because racial anxiety can have quite toxic effects as well. So racial anxiety refers to the stress or concern that people often feel before or during an interracial interaction. And not surprisingly, it's generally experienced differently depending upon the group that you're in. If you are in the non-dominant group, your concern, somewhat understandably, is that you may be subject to or experience hostility or stereotyping linked to your race or ethnicity or gender, depending on our scenario, but again, it's most acute with race and ethnicity. If you are part of the dominant group, <coughs> remember, we think racists are immoral, right? So if you're part of the dominant group, you're often worried, am I gonna say or do something that is gonna cause the person I'm interacting with to think that I am racist? And that causes anxiety in you that often leads to exactly the opposite of what you, what you hoped because we often manifest anxiety, almost all of us, behaviorally by being closed, by having less eye contact, sitting further away, avoiding the conversation altogether, being awkward, saying exactly what we didn't want to say. Anxiety depletes your brain and raises your cortisol. None of us engage most effectively when we're anxious. So again, for the people who are in the front of the room, people who have the power essentially, the law professors, who set the tone for the interaction with the student, who set the comfort level for a student who you know, should hopefully get a letter of recommendation, who set the tone for the class. We have to address our anxieties to make sure we're not inadvertently creating the impression to our students that we're biased. Because that's what it looks like. You know, the law professor's like, I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I'm just not going to say anything. That either looks like just really weird social skills, which frankly law professors have as well, but if, <laughs> but if the professor's like, hey, how you doing, when it's a white guy, and I, when it's someone who's not white, that doesn't just look like bad social skills, that looks like bias. So that's work we have to do too, and it seems like, well, gee, these are tension, you just made me feel biased, and now you're telling me not to be anxious about being biased. And it's true, there is a little bit of a catch-22 here, but it's work we can do. Those of us in the front of the room, we can be the ones to say, you know, come on into my office. I'm really excited to see you. Let's get to know each other. We can do that work. Now, it can be horrible and awkward and wildly inauthentic because people read that too. And I have to say, again, I give these talks and people come and tell me stories all the time. There's this phenomenon that I would really have thought would have gone away a long time ago, of particularly white women, when they meet a black woman, being wildly enthusiastic to touch her hair. <laughs> we can't touch people's hair. Thank you. But Thank I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know there are times I've heard that, and then she walked up to me and said, oh, can I touch your, get your hands out of my hair. So, so the, again, we can't overstep boundaries in our attempt to be warm. We have to work in a different place of it being genuine and not strange and weird. Um, classroom manifestation. So the typical way that law professors manage this 
anxiety we have is often we just never talk about race. It doesn't matter what the topic is, we're not going to talk about race. So we don't talk about it. That is noticeable to students and can feel extremely insensitive when we're in the world that we're in right now where issues of race are affecting us constantly. See, how screwed up badly last year when we didn't, we didn't do anything in response to the Eric Garner or the Ferguson decisions. We didn't take a community step. And it was very hurtful to the students of color who were feeling it acutely. Most professors didn't talk about it in class. They didn't know what to say, but it felt like we didn't care. It was really a mistake. So we can't just not talk about things. That's not the answer. Um, but we can't act like racist like anything else either and be perfectly comfortable throwing out any topic because we're all lawyers and you know, rape, race, whatever. We can say exactly what we want. That's not quite right either, right? It is appropriate to be aware that some topics land in a different emotional place for some of our students than they do for others. So there is this balance that we can achieve. Because some professors will say, I'm surly with everybody. I'll throw a book at whoever walks into my office. And so I know I'm not racist because I do this to everybody. Well, again, that's lovely for you that you throw books at everybody. <laughs> but the students don't necessarily know that. And so useful to be aware that what you can kind of get away with with someone who looks just like your son because it's done with a, like, a little wink and a nod isn't necessarily experience with someone with whom you don't have any kind of shared connection. So again, there's work that can be done in the classroom that has to be this balance between avoidance and it's all fine. Why do I have George Bush up here? This is not a political talk, I swear. Um, the reason I do, this is also from Josh Aronson, um, he often starts talks on stereotype threat by asking people to estimate George Bush's SAT score. And interestingly, people tend to estimate it at far lower than it is. <laughs> And if you, if you follow Bush's career, you might have seen his debating skills diminish dramatically from the time that he was governor of Texas to the time he was president. And some social psychologists basically say this narrative went out that this guy wasn't very smart, and the more pronounced the narrative became, probably the more anxious he became, and the more worried he became about confirming the stereotype that he was not very smart. And so the more mistakes that he made and the more uh, awkward his sentences became, hence the wonderful <laughs> quote, they misunderestimated me. <laughs> and I you know, we can pick a gazillion quotes. So this is not a political talk, it's just it's, he's an interesting example. Even someone of inordinate privilege can suffer from this powerful, powerful phenomenon called stereotype threat, which is the fear that we're going to confirm a negative stereotype about our group when that identity is salient. My colleague Jerry Kahn uh, likens it to, if some of you are runners, if everyone's running into a headwind, that's one thing, but if one person in the race is running into a headwind and everybody else has the wind at their back, the best runner isn't necessarily going to win that race and probably won't, because that person is running against a powerful uh, force that everyone else is free from. And so stereotype threat isn't just choking. It's literally the cognitive interference that we can experience when our identity is salient. You know, you're the only woman in a room full of men. You're the only person of color in a room full of white people, whatever it may be. Turns out, uh, turns out white guys who take a test where they're one of the few white men, I think we talked about this yesterday, they're one of the few white males in a room full of Asian men do far worse on their math tests. Because they have this stereotype about themselves and, and math vis a vis Asian men, and so they do far worse. Their stereotypes are triggered. So it can be any of us. I won't tell that story because I don't have time, but it's a good one. Um, this is not inevitable. We can create environments in which stereotype threat is far less likely to be triggered. And there's a way, particularly, because this is very fraught often, to share cross-racial criticism and feedback. And what I've heard when I talk to law schools and law students is often students of color feel like they just don't get feedback. Just none. Because from their white professors. They just, there's an awkwardness and so they just don't get much interaction at all. And there's the sort of, if I do criticism, it's not going to be heard well because people are going to think I'm biased, like the, the you know, the, like the, the essay uh, test, and that's a real risk. But there's a way that we can share our feedback that can create an environment in which all of our students know that we're there working with them because we see where they can be fabulous. 
And so it's this mechanism of wise criticism where you assure your students with all, it has to be completely genuine, of your high expectations. You look to them to identify what makes them strong, what makes them potentially a fantastic lawyer. You work to identify that and then you share what you've identified and then share the feedback that will help them realize their uh, most significant potential. And this works for everybody, of course, but it can be most important uh, in the cross race. So finally, I would just urge the students in the room, and I don't know who here is a student or who here is a professor because everybody looks fairly mature and also young at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, for the students in the room, again, you have a wonderful institution, you have fabulous people leading it, fabulous people who are part of the community, many of whom are people I admire uh, enormously, but I'm sure this institution, like many, has issues that you're grappling with. I would urge people to create a team to help each other see the landmines, to create real authentic engagement across gender, race, ethnicity, and other lines of difference. And that will kind of help see where the where bias lays or where someone's just surly. You know, what's the kind of person we can go to for the real feedback and who doesn't give it to you? But you can kind of weather it more smoothly if you have so, you know, if, you, if you only have, if I only have white female friends, any bad thing that happens to us seems like it's because of our gender. But if I have, you know, multi, as, I, as I did in law school and in practice, I have friends of all groups. So I could say to, you know, the guy, Jim, Jim Hooper, the guy, the white guy with the green on the right, he was a great one for me to say, I just had this interaction with so-and-so. What's your inter interaction with him like? If Hooper said, he treated me like garbage, I'd be like, okay, it's not my gender. It treats everyone like garbage. It can be very helpful, because some of us really are surly and have terrible social skills, and it's useful to know when our interaction is awkward because of that, as opposed to when is that a professor who really needs to do some work. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry to be so much. amount more than we did in 2010 mm -hmm. about how we can individually do work to reduce our bias, but more importantly, we know that the work really, for it to be real, has to be done institutionally. Because it's too hard for each individual to try and kind of, you know, change their unconscious themselves. That's a big mountain to climb up. But if an institution can use, use data, use, you know, sort of qualitative information climate surveys to try and figure out where are our vulnerabilities institutionally speaking, what do we need to alter and change broadly speaking to help people kind of be their best selves. There's quite a bit that can be done and accomplished and the stereotype threat work as you, as you mentioned, uh, Josh Aronson and there's a, again a host of other people, Melanie Pretty Vaughn, a whole bunch of other people. There's so much phenomenal work about how we can create environments in which students aren't as likely to be triggered. And so the stereotype threat doesn't kind of sit on their shoulders and impede their ability to do their best work. And so again, I would urge the leaders in the institution to begin to think about how can we integrate what we know about de-triggering de stereotype threat into our curricula, into our orientation practices. There's you know, sort of there's some remarkable findings about the importance, for example, when you're entering into a new institution, sort of thinking about what motivated you and thinking about it in a community-oriented way and sort of thinking about how you contribute to the collective public good that seems to be very powerful, particularly for students of color, in keeping the individual threat from being triggered. And so again, just having valuing people's stories, 
understanding that the sort of individualistic, kind of highly interpersonally competitive nature of law schools, frankly, don't have to exist that way. And that we can create an alternative environment that isn't about people not being excellent. It is about excellence, but it's about kind of collective excellence. And it's about excellence for a reason other than individual success, which can be which can be seen as alienating. So there's, there's so much work that we now know about that can be used by institutions successfully to, again, help the institution be true to its own values and behaviors. Can I hold you to one question and let some other people <laughs> And we'll come back to you. Did someone else, Norm, did you want to ask a question? Well, yeah, or did you, did you end? <laughs> the healer? No, no, well, yeah, no, I think mean, really terrific and very, very interesting. Um, my first thought was uh, that uh, a couple months ago, the New York Times read an article about Donald Trump, in which they talked about his growing up in Queens and uh, speculating as to how somebody growing up in such a diverse environment could nevertheless manage to have so much bias. Um, and it led me to think about whether or not what you're talking about is acquired or learned, or whether or not it's made, um, whether or not these, these, these things you're talking about. So I'm, I'm glad you raised the question, because the answer to some degree is both. Um, we are all hardwired to identify who our groups are. Like, that's part of human evolution, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. It's how we define, so, so there was a New York Times article that also said babies were racist um, because babies responded more favorably to uh, people who had the same color, the same color as their primary caregiver's skin. But there was a follow-up article that didn't get nearly as much attention. Um, language actually trumped skin color when it came to familiarity and baby's comfort. So the babies who heard, you know, sort of French spoken by the primary caregiver and then heard French spoken by someone with skin different than their primary caregiver and English spoken by someone with the same skin color as the primary caregiver gravitated toward the person with the language. So it, yes, we do, you know, evolutionarily speaking, of course, try and identify who our groups are. And so that is innate. But the definition of who constitutes our group is utterly constructed, right? And so with respect, I mean, Trump's a funny example because, you know, as those of you who followed him know, he actually has, interestingly, a very diverse group of friends. And people have liked him, historically, across group. And he has liked them, historically, across group. Some would suggest he's someone who's using a different phenomenon that I, that I sometimes talk about that I didn't hear, which is he's using racial threat to get political votes. He's using the idea of people like us, and by us, he's signaling, yeah, I guess, you know, white males particularly, people like us are getting a, a bad shake. And if people like them weren't essentially screwing things up for people like us, we'd be better off. That's racial threat. You know, that's trying to kind of maintain power. And it's very, it's manipulative and cynical. I have no idea how particularly biased he is or isn't. Because this seems all very calculated as opposed to anything implicit going on. Do you know what I mean? So he is growing up in a diverse environment. Frankly, maybe why he had a diverse group of friends before he went to politics. Because he really did. So he's a funny. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No, go on. Uh, so my question is one that I think is triggers personal, political, and strategic and institutionally like moving forward in terms of reducing implicit bias. You don't struggle with it, but in, 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 uh, reducing implicit bias. And so um, I, I would like your thoughts on uh, last year we actually, our BALSA students and Professor Klein is here as well. We put on, uh, they put on, rather, a panel, blood on, on, on leaves, and it was powerful and strong. It was, it was all that to use, you know, colloquial language, if you will, very powerful. John Bell um, like, was here. The response to Gardner. And the response to Gardner was also. Um, and yes. so my question is, um, is there a situation where uh, stereotype threat and racial anxiety are in conflict? And in that situation, one must yield. So let me use the example of the panel, uh, the, 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 where the, the students felt, and our administration was very responsive to our students, and, and quite frankly, that night was very emotional. I got choked up as the students were choked up, and um, it, it was very intellectual, high, you know, high bar conversation. Um, but the thought was, in, in, in some ways, throughout the law school, I don't think it was a dominant thought, um, that it raised the 
racial anxiety of, of students who aren't black. In other words, that the students, the black students, also, or the you know, black students holding this conference, black rage, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? And, and, and for them, it's a moment of expression and, and, and a, a you know, needed conversation and outlet space um, for stuff that's happening perhaps outside of the institution, coming into the institution and into the classroom discussion, where the racial anxiety that it might trigger in the non-black students or faculty or what have you must yield, or it doesn't have to. But so I'm, I guess I'm opening the table up for for your for your comments. So I would entirely agree with you that there often is a quite a bit of racial anxiety that whites experience when having, essentially being confronted with sort of the, the, the painful realities of what's happening in our country. That does make whites very uncomfortable. And that's where we get to the cognitive interference. You know, the white people see blatant discrimination, you see these videos, and it's very, very disturbing. In a, in a way that is, in part, oh my gosh, do people think this about me? Am I, am I like that? I mean, sort of, so it, does, it is a racial anxiety moment, you're right. But I, of course, I think you'll not be surprised to hear, absolutely, in that instance, there should be the program, and we should let the racial anxiety essentially bubble up so that we can address it. So ideally, what you'd have is you'd have the program. The program would be a safe space, and however it was constructed, to be the most powerful experience for the students. Because frankly, what, what we you know what we know about these last two years is that for many people of color, it, it feels like it's it's me, right? I, I mean, the number of mothers I've talked to of, of sons who are in fear of their sons being the victims of crime. It feels like this is me, and for a lot of whites, it's kind of it's like. In this individual incident that happened to someone else, and it's very sad, but it doesn't feel like it's about me. So the, the, the addressing that reality of that emotion in the law school is absolutely the right thing to do. What I think then ideally can happen is whites who have this, do people think this about me? Like, is this about me? What do I say? Because sometimes the anxiety can be, I want to be supportive, but I don't know, do I have a, should I say something? You know, am I white splaining by saying anything? I just learned about white splaining, and now I'm like, am I white splaining? Oh my God! And this white lady who's up here talking about race, how can I not be white splaining? <laughs> white splaining. You should watch, Google it, and this is why I'm anxious about it. So, so, it's, so, so the idea of, of again overstepping and saying, you know, putting your voice in when you sh when you should be stepping back and being supportive, it can be really difficult to navigate for, you know, even very concerned white students. But I think that's the work. What, I, what, I, what hopefully will happen is sort of the white people who care about these issues will start to do the racial navigation, part of which is being uncomfortable and asking questions, not just jumping in and sort of you know, giving the explanation and using colloquial terms that we sound ridiculous when we say, you know, like don't suddenly think that you can kind of be in the center and should be the center, which is again, ironic that this person is standing in front of the room. Um, and I sometimes address that uh, because, it, like, why am I here? Who am I to be doing this? And the answer to that basically is, you know, John Powell and others have said, we need all hands on deck. This is a fight for all of us. And, you know, as the person knows, I've been a civil rights lawyer my whole career. And I have, you know, I won't tell you my whole story of why, but that's who I am. And the role I've tried to play is, you know, I, I don't, I didn't call you and say, you can be stage, right? Like, I wouldn't do that. But if you call me and say, I'd like to have you come speak, I'm very grateful to have the invitation. And so, I think you guys, it's, I'm, so, I, I'm so happy for your students that you have a dean and you have you and you, and you did create that moment because we didn't for our students and it continues to be painful for them. And we're, you know, we're trying to make up for it, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was a big error. Anybody else before I let, oh. And then Courtney, and then we'll come back to you. I know you have a question. I just want to let everybody. Well, okay. I really like this work you're doing, and I think it's great for getting out from law school, uh, uh, law school in general. But to me, it seems like almost like a bubble because, like, once I step out of out of, out of school, on the social media, I can see my friends and my dad. Like, like, you have people that sort of don't don't want to. Yes. So, so first of all, the one thing that I would 
policy that, that may give you a, hopefully a little bit of hope is the amount of interest by institutions you never think would be interested in this work is unbelievable. So, you know, prosecutors in North Carolina, Cook County, hospitals in western Michigan, I mean, institutions finally, and you know, it's awful, it's horrific that it had to be on literally, you know, the blood of, of on our young people. It's horrific that, that that had to happen and we had to all see that for finally this work to be getting attention. And I don't just mean this work, but all the work around kind of creating, creating a racial equity and having that be real. But there is widespread interest. And so I encourage anyone who's interested, including you, to, to, to learn as much as you can and be part of that conversation, part of that work, because it there is enormous interest. It, it is not enough bandwidth to respond to it right now. So it's not just in law schoolers' bubbles. It's actually really far reaching. So that's good. But with respect to social media, it really does seem like, again, approximately 15% of the country, according to social scientists, are hardcore racists. And I think they spend a lot of time on social media. Like most of their time. Like they don't have jobs, they're just on social media. Yeah, so it, I suppose. So so certainly I, I think there I think we do actually get a um, distorted picture of who out there really, this is their, they really believe this stuff. There are the manipulators, and again, we talked a little bit about, and again, I hate to be partisan in any way, but I think it's really hard to not think of Trump as someone who truly is manipulating on these issues because he's expressed about it. Um, but I think that there, there are far more potential allies, I think, than we, than we, than we realize. And you know, when I got the call from the self-proclaimed, I'm a Republican white male from North Carolina, and I need John Powell and Song Richardson and you to come down and teach my prosecutors what we can do because we're screwing this up and we don't want to. We want to do our jobs right. Like that's that's exciting. So, Courtney, are you? We are, you know, cold mashed potatoes are really. <laughs> so, I'll be super brief. You be super brief. Can you be sort of brief? Sure. Not super brief. Or, or yeah. over to the lunch. I'm interested Are you in coming the language. Out of lunch? I can't. I'm, sorry. Okay. I'm interested in the language and the thing that I see in a community that's that's relevant to me, which is the peer community talks a lot about ally status and how to how to be a decent ally about, you know, being both both the responsibility to teach allies and the responsibility of being a teachable ally. Um, and I don't hear a lot of that language. I heard you say ally just a minute ago, but I don't hear a lot of that language in the same conversation. And I I'm curious about the, the lack of sameness of the language and what do you think that's about? So people have different reactions. I really love that language, the ally language, and I think I do think as a white person who wants to do racial justice work, to me, and I actually have a really great slide that I didn't show called Managing Progressive Optics on the, the work to earn the right, to, to, to earn being an ally. You're not just an ally because you say you are, you have to kind of earn that. Um, but, but you're right, I don't hear that all the time. Some people, there, there seem to be weird responses in the racial justice world. I, I mean, I don't think they're two same situations. No, but I, I think, think the idea... I think they're analogous in the language of the person. The idea that someone who is not I, you know, situated in the experience of the person, the, the, the people who are directly on the receiving end of the bias, that people, again, a white person in the racial justice world has a role to play, I think many would say that that's right. And the question is, what role is that? How, who determines how you play it? How do you play it in a way that you're not overstepping? I think all those same questions are uh, certainly occurring within the racial justice community. And some people, again, I like the word ally too, um, but I, it's, I don't know that it is happening, you're right, with as much um, uh, intentionality. But I think that's changing a little bit to some degree. Yes? Really quick. I'm a, my name is Jewel. I'm a third year law student here at Hofstra. I'm curious as to um, what your thoughts on how do how do we as students get um, other students who are ne not necessarily bearing the brunt of implicit bias involved and getting them to actually care? For example, like coming here today. Um, so, what can we do to motivate and encourage each other in this community? So, I think it may well be that. There are, again, students who are afraid to come into the space because they're afraid it's going to be a shame and blame, mm -hmm. and that they're going to come and they're going to be called racist and they're just going to walk away feeling bad. Because that's how I think people often experience discussions about race. And so, and, and I, 
ideally it wouldn't have to be on you, frankly, as a person on the receiving end to do that work of, of bringing people in. To the extent that you are interested in doing that work and have are willing to do that work, you know, I think uh, the whole community owes you gratitude. Um, I think if you can, if, if you can encourage teachers of a cross group and perhaps, the, the, so at Seton Hall there actually is beginning to be a, co a coalescing around bringing the, you know, sort of the dominant group into the conversation and specifically using these tools because they can be really useful. And, I, and so I, yeah, I'm sure you have a student body organization, like an SBA kind of thing. So, so, so for someone, and again, I'm not sure who would want to play that role to, to say the SBA, you know, we want this to be a community-wide effort and we want, you know, and, and the SBA frankly should be involved in this kind of effort because we're all entering the world together. And frankly, I mean, there's, there's what, what's, what's fascinating is people who have racial navigational skills of whatever race, gender, ethnicity have a huge advantage in whatever institution they go to. So any white student who does serious work on this is going to do far better wherever they go than white students who still don't know how to handle cross-race dynamics and who shy away from these conversations. So there's actually a, a very functional reason, of, of, in addition to the kind of moral community building we care about everyone in our community reason. And but, but I, be, I would be curious if someone you know, if someone can have a conversation with you know some of the student leaders who you might have hoped would come for a conversation like this. You know why didn't you come? Just curious. And it may well be the sort of the racial anxiety. Is this for me? Like, what do I have to do with this? And I'm just going to make you feel bad. That that's what I, I've often encountered. We're now teaching it. You know, we're teaching it in our learning classes. We're, uh, we're you know, we're, we're having it part of the curriculum because, frankly, it is a set of lawyering skills as well as human, more you know, the skills linked to being a good person. But it's actually lawyering skills as well. So I, I don't think it's a completely satisfactory answer to your question. Um, but again, I think as a, I think I, again, I give you tremendous credit because it is a lot of work to be someone who's pulling other people along, right? And ideally, there would be more white students who are doing that with you and taking more of the of, of the uh, taking on more of the effort to do that and not, not having that to have to fall on the students of color all the time. But to the extent that you're willing to do it, it's obviously great for the institution. It is. So anybody that's going to lunch, hold your question. I know, I know, I promised you. Don't worry, go. Yeah, because uh, we spoke about merits and we understand the fact that students are biased and stereotype threats when it comes to student performance. And, uh, you know, I still remember the works by, uh, what's the name of it? Scott Davis, you know, the difference. Yeah. Charles Lawrence, Lenny Lanier. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be talking about, you know, you need to uh, expand the meaning of merit I mean, what's really interesting is a lot of the implicit bias, stereotype threat work suggests we're missing the boat on even using traditional criteria. But, you know, in a sense, I think there's, I think there's a great deal to be said about broadening the skill sets that we respect and recognize without any question. Um, because we know that being a lawyer isn't just about sitting and taking a three hour exam and, you know, writing things very quickly in you know, a particular way, we know that. And so I think broadening what we recognize as merit is absolutely something that we should be doing as institutions to be realistic about what makes a great lawyer.